drug deal gone bad results in the death of a local teen. And you've seen them around town in their black and yellow RV, and now Pete and Ademo are in studio for an interview. Good evening, and welcome to this week's edition of Free Keen TV. It is July 25th, and I am your anchor, Michelle Seven. In breaking news tonight, a drug deal gone bad results in the death of a local teen, te local keen teen. Anonymous sources close to Free Keen TV have reported that Craig Metivier of Keen had plans to confront Ethan Wilson, also of Keen, over monies owed. Ethan had been tipped off, and when Craig arrived, a fight ensued between the two, wherein Ethan allegedly stabbed Craig to death. Ethan Wilson was arrested by police and arraigned at Keen District Court this morning. Let's take a moment to thank whomever is responsible for the glorious opportunity provided in Keene Square this last Saturday. It was a lovely day with temperatures cooling and Keene was bustling. Traffic was heavy and pedestrians were out in full force. It was fantastic to witness what transpired around the square. Absent were the typical traffic delays. Instead, there were yellow and red blinking lights. Self-organizing reigned supreme. No car accidents were reported, no pedestrians run over. Cheers to you, Keen, for demonstrating that independent thought, personal responsibility, and common sense are alive and well. You may have seen their black and yellow RV around. It's affectionately known as MARV, short for Mobile Authority Resistance Vehicle. Well, tonight, we have civil disobedience activists Pete Ayer and Ademo Freeman in studio. They'll be joining Lance Weber and Heike Corser to discuss their not guilty verdict against Massachusetts police. Arrested a year ago, they were charged with felony wiretapping, a charge punishable by imprisonment. They have since been acquitted, but are steadfast and determined more than ever to promote liberty. Here's a video of the arrest incident in Greenfield, Massachusetts. Back to uh, get rich, Paul. They tell me you got to tell you guys to get rid of the cameras again. So seriously, sure. Um, can we just give you five hundred forty bucks and go? I mean, I'll, I'll stay on my back term. I don't care. I just want to get rich, Paul. We go ahead, get out of here. Are you guys gonna put them away or not? Man, we just want our friend. We want to go. He's our accountability. It's a security blanket. All right, there's five forty. Counted. They're not putting them away. Come on. They don't want to do that either. You guys don't want to put them in a locker either? We just like, it was, we were, we it, it was explained to us earlier, we the could guy in the white shirt said, what, what changed? Not, yeah, why is it so arbitrary? We just want to pay and be, be free to go. It's a control friends. thing, man. No one put them in a locker it's, it's just, we have the money. How long does it take to get them out? We will be out of this town in no time. I mean, if he's not free to go, free based on the, if he's not free to go based on us meeting the criteria y'all have set forth, which well, is a driver's license and money. The criteria because you can't have the camera. Well, we were told earlier we could, and minutes. that just shows how arbitrary it is. So this is good. You're going to be accountable for this too, personally accountable. Are you yelling somebody? Yeah. Okay. You got your cameras on? No. You got to turn the camera off. But can you show it's me a statute rules. that says that? That's their rules. Show me in the rules. No, Department rules. rules. We were told, earlier, come to a we were told earlier by a supervisor that we could film as long as we weren't yeah. filming anybody else. And that these weren't going in the jail. Of the it, state it, and apparently ourselves. that's changed. They've asked you to shut your cameras off in here or leave. Yeah, um, make I'm things explaining to you. Can we talk to you, you outside? To your, yeah, let's walk right outside. Yeah, let's walk outside. Go outside. By the way, you don't have my permission. I'm really important. Well, so you, you if work your mics for us. aren't on, you work for us. I don't work for you. Sure you do. I don't work for you. Is it illegal? You need to turn the audio recording portion of that off because I'm going to arrest both of you. I don't know if that's a law. Is that your, is that your motorhome over there? I don't have to answer. Are we being questioned now? Are you yes. investigating me? Yes. Then I refuse to answer your question. Okay. You guys need to leave the premises. The cameras are not wanted on this facility. Okay. Do you you have to put them up. You're not listening to me. You put those away, you can bail your buddy. That's it. Otherwise, you have to leave. It's gonna go. You guys work for us, and we can't film the people who work for us. Just interactions. Go. Government's go, supposed to be transparent. You, <laughs> you can't go, do that. Gonna... No, man. Dude, you should take your Come hands on. off of me. Come on. Please. Sir, take your hands off of me. Sir, you're hurting me. Put your hands behind your back. Sir, you're hurting me. Put your hands behind your back. You're hurting me, sir. Let's go. You gotta go. Sir, what are you guys up to? You, gotta go. you guys, I don't know you. I don't know. I don't like strangers putting their hands on me. If you don't leave, you're gonna be Come placed on. under arrest. Do you understand me? I don't like strangers putting their hands on me and forcing me. Put your hands behind your back. In places I don't want to go. Behind your back. That's my property, sir. You can't do that. Stop. 
And now to Lance and Heike for this much anticipated interview. Shocking video. The customer service skills of these people never ceases to amaze me. Pete and Ademo, thank you for joining us in the studio tonight. <clears throat> Why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about yourselves? Sure. Uh, my name is Pete Ayer. I've been uh, kind of an activist on the road now for about two and a half years. First through a uh, project called Motorhome Diaries, which took myself, a demo, and another friend, Jason Talley, on the road for seven months. Went to uh, 41 states and met a lot of people. Essentially, uh, I believe that we as an individuals, we own ourselves. We should be free to act as long as we're not initiating force. So we go about introducing these ideas to people through video and outreach and meetups and, you know, just trying to live, live them. So. Yeah, I'm a demo. I've pretty much been doing the same thing with Pete, a livery activist for about the last two and a half years. Uh, we travel around, make videos, and just, just try to be, just try to have an impact with folks. And uh, we feel on the ground and, uh, you know, hands-on activism coupled with some uh, social networking and new media aspects is just the way to get it done. So it's a uh, pleasure to be with you guys here in Keene and uh, on this panel today. Well, it looks like you're certainly making an impact. Uh, let me congratulate you on your excellent victory last week down in Greenfield, Massachusetts. <clears throat> Why don't you tell us a little bit about the original charges and what each one of you was charged with? Sure. We, uh, we were initially arrested, as you saw in the video there at the end. Adamo was getting arrested first by Todd M. Dodge at the Greenfield Police Department. Uh, they charged us with trespassing and uh, resisting arrest because we both went limp when they put handcuffs on us. And then they, um, they charged us later with felony wiretapping. And they also went into my RV, uh, Marv, uh, that we spoke of earlier, and, uh, which was parked a few blocks away, not involved at all. And they uh, went in there without a warrant, just a fishing expedition, charged us. They claimed the VIN number had been manipulated, so they charged it with a VIN uh, number man man manipulation, which is a misdemeanor, as well as a felony uh, charge. They said they found some ammo in a closed metal container in the back of the RV. So uh, in, in total, we were charged with three felonies and five misdemeanors. You know, and we didn't hurt anybody or damage any property. Right, and that was just the start of the Greenfield Police intention to punish us that day. They went further, like breaking into Pete's RV and things like that, just to be, you know, d difficult to us, to make things more complicated. And even during the process of booking us, uh, you know, we, did, we kept asking them questions, and so they, they were being more physical with us. They locked us into a cage after stripping us uh, down, and uh, it was freezing and stuff. So they were really trying, you know, the guy in the, in the dispatch office was... Uh, talking to us over the intercom system and uh, intimidating us and trying to get us wild up. So it was all, uh, you know, try to trump up charges and punish you from that day on, you know. So you had to spend the night in jail that night after the arrest, isn't that right? That's right, yeah. We were, we were uh, arrested July 1st, 2010, spent the night in jail. We were arraigned the next day. And, you know, as the demo said, and as, you know, as we try to do, we just try to uh, encourage people to think for themselves. And we try to, you know, we don't advocate working through the political system because we believe that's force but rather uh, encourage people to, to engage in voluntary interactions uh, in, throughout their uh, life. And uh, so we were trying to encourage the people who were arresting us and caging us, like, hey, you're responsible for your actions, trying to get them to think about this. And uh, one of the guys, uh, as I was being put in the cage that night, uh, you know, he hung his head as he was about to shut the door. Right after they got done, uh, you know, taking my pants off and, and, and searching me, uh, and he said, I'm with you more than you think. And I said, you know, if you're with us, then you would quit your job. And he said, you know, my family wouldn't understand. And I said, well, if they love you and respect you, they'd figure out, they'd ask, they'd want to know why you quit your job if you did the right thing. You know, if you, you know this is wrong locking up peaceful people. And essentially that's what it's about. So, um, yeah, the next day we, we went, uh, we got arraigned. Um, you know, f the past year we've been going through the uh, legal uh, hoops of court down there at Greenfield. And uh, about how many times did you have to go back to court in between the original arraignment date of the morning after your arrest and the trial last week? I mean, there was a lot of work that was put into uh, preparing ourselves for this case, not only from the legal aspect, but outside of it. And uh, I mean, from the moment that we started, we were asking, like Pete stated, the individuals who had done wrong to us to make it right, you know, and hey, it's not, it's not these laws that you're enforcing, because there was no policy or law that they showed us anyways. But even if there were, you know, they're not keeping anybody safe. You know, why are you doing this to people who are just trying to hold others accountable that are peaceful? And all the way through the line, the police officers that day, down to uh, the DA, Jeffrey Bankston, you know, we had a thing that we do at coplock.org, a website Pete and I are involved at, uh, that does call floods. And so even at some point, he was saying to us, you know, these calls should stop. And we said, well, you should stop prosecuting peaceful people who are holding public officials who were forced to pay for uh, accountable, you know, and not to mention in that jail, they were filming us that day. So 
why don't we have the right to film when you do? Or if I'm forced to pay for you, then why do I need to give you the option to film you? You know, it doesn't sound you know quite right to me. So those are some of the issues that we would take up with the individuals personally. But as far as court dates and pre preparing for those, I think we had about eight, nine. Yeah, we went down there pretty often, and. Uh you know, we right out of the gate, we, we didn't want to sign their paperwork. We didn't want to say, you know, we'll represent. We, we did say we're going to go pro se and represent ourselves because, you know, we don't need to go to law school for three years to know how to tell the truth. You know, we can we can we know what happened that day. We know right and wrong. And we know we didn't do anything wrong. So, you know, we didn't sign their paperwork to say we didn't want lawyers or anything like that. And they eventually assigned us lawyers over our objections and they eventually joined our cases over our objections. And they did all these things, you know, the. The rationale for the latter uh, joining of our cases was to uh, sensibly save the Commonwealth money, and we said, "Hey, if you want to do that, just dismiss our charges because you know they're 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 bunk." But um, you know that didn't happen, and uh, we went down a number of times. It was fortunately, uh, you know, we call Key in our home base, and we're not on the road. And uh, a lot of our friends and, and folks from the area that saw what happened uh, started coming out and, and uh, supporting us, and it was great. It made a big difference. Um, you know, there's one instance we went down there in uh, January and Damo was supposed to have trial and I had pretrial. For some reason, our court cases were at different statuses, right. you know, despite the fact we were arrested on the same day and we, we inquired about that and they were never able to tell us why. So on the day we went down there and they, and they joined our cases, it was a, you know, we were there for about two minutes and I started asking questions about policy and people started, you know, our friends that were there started asking questions as well. And right away the judge stood up and said, you know, I'm off the bench, I'm done. And they just wanted to clear the courtroom. and. You know, we, we use that as an opportunity to, to engage with the, the district attorney and the police officers there and everybody and, and let them know of, of uh, you know, that they are personally responsible. One of the action. things the videos highlight that, you know, we videotaped this whole process from arrest to the uh, trial last week. And, you know, folks want to check that out, they can head over to coplock.org uh, slash Greenfield or even on youtube.com slash the coplock on our playlist there is one from Greenfield. And we've tried everything from us uh, attending these proceedings, motions to... Uh, dismiss, suppress evidence. We even crashed a public safety committee meeting within the community, talked to the mayor. We went through every avenue we could think of for accountability, and like Pete was leading to this, his last statement, I think the most effective part was winning in the court of public opinion by being as transparent with the videos as possible, having them on YouTube, blogging about this whole process um, has allowed people to, to see you know, really where, where the victim is in that. That allowed them to support us, which like Pete said, there was 60 people in the courtroom there was cheering clapping uh, I think that really sent a signal to the jury that like the community or most folks don't want this to happen to these people for whatever reasons and that you know a good question we asked several times for the trial is should we be punished for this act whatever form that might be even if it's a fine or caging so the public support the documentation I really think are all things folks can take from and learn from let's talk about your trial preparations for a minute I know you guys filed a couple of different pretrial motions Let's talk about what motions those were, how you prepared, how you came to decide which sort of motions to file, and how much time went into those, and then what result that had on the overall proceeding. Okay, yeah, uh, before the trial started uh, last Monday, uh, July 18th, we, we had filed, I think, three motions. The first to uh, dismiss our charges because, one, we said there's no victim, there's no jurisdiction. You know, it was a, a Mark Stevens, if people are familiar with him, approach. And uh, the judge said, all right, I'll, give, I'll uh, rule on this in 30 days. I'll take it under advisement. And Damo, we filed another one, and Damo took the lead to uh, dismiss the felony wiretapping charges because the way the statute's written in Massachusetts is it hinges on whether the recording was done in secretive, and there was no way they could claim ours were because we both had video cameras right out in front of us. It's shown on the video. It's clear as day. It's in all the reports, all the police reports that we got in the first uh, paragraph all mentioned that they either saw the cameras or were told there were cameras there and there was recording going on. So there was no way. This was just... Uh, you know, a, a wrong charge applied, and I think like a demo uh, touched on earlier. You know, they, they tried to stack the charges on initially. We had eight charges in total. By the time we got to um, to trial, and they eventually ruled on trial, we were only facing three. They had dismissed uh, the five of them. So the the first motion we filed was taken advisement 30 days. The second one taken advisement 30 days. The judge was 60 days and 90 days late on ruling on those. Or it took him 60 days and 90 days, and there was no repercussions. You know, we said you you don't even stand by the own um, you, the own dates you set for yourself. So what, what what would happen if if you if we set a date or you set a date for us and we didn't comply with that? You know, I think the uh, outcome would be quite different. Right. So Pete and I actually had to go into court one day, and we were we asked to file a motion to see the judge, and they were like, you can't talk to the judge, you can't call him, you can't see him, you can't talk to him anything. And uh, it, that was a Thursday, and then that Monday we got all the rulings back yeah. that they were uh, denied. 
So it's really convenient. But like Pete said, if you don't show up to court for 90 days, they'll send my guns to your house. But here, it's no big deal. Nobody wants to ask him. No one wants to hold him accountable. So, so were all your pretrial motions denied then? Well, the, the third motion we filed, a motion to dismiss, uh, to suppress the evidence against uh, against me for the VIN manipulation and the felony ammo charge for when they went in my vehicle and my home. I mean, it's where we live uh, without a warrant. Um, that, that was, uh, we heard that on July 11th, and, and even before the uh, court yeah, started that day, I was sitting out in the hall ready to go in, you know, with a stack of uh, questions and, uh, and, and, you know, what I was going to base my comments off of. And the uh, district attorney, Jeff Bankston, came up and said, hey, we're going to null proxies, essentially dismiss them. So I didn't even have to go up. They knew they were in the wrong, they didn't want to be on the record about it. So they dropped those two charges. So then when we went to trial last week, we had, uh, we both faced. Uh, trespassing, resisting arrest, and felony wiretapping. And uh, before the uh, trial, you know, concluded, all of those were dropped except for felony wiretapping against us both and resisting against the demo. So that's those were the charges the jury mm -hmm. ruled on. And it shows people something. It's that if you keep saying no, it's first we'll sign this piece of paper. No, no, no. Fine, you have these attorneys. We don't want the attorneys. You get them anyways. And then it's no, no, no. Question, question. Pretty much with motions and no answers except for the ones that help them. And then afterwards, you know, you have this trial and you I mean, you still, we got a verdict, but you still get accountability. The, the police are still out there uh, doing what they did and, and they've done it again. There's loss. I mean, the day before the trial, we could have taken a plea deal for $300 and basically bought out. We spent probably 10 to 20 times that going back to Greenfield, spending weeks there. So it's not about the money. It wasn't about... Uh, whether well, or not what was wrong. the plea offer going to be a plea a guilty plea to a misdemeanor or to, to a felony or misdemeanors they would drop the felonies I see so. okay and we had to agree not to sue them so I think that's very telling <laughs> as well but in addition to all the courtroom stuff and Daniel mentioned we were down there for quite a while we were down there uh, for a week a couple months ago we were down there for a week before the trial and you know doing outreach we, we probably distributed close to 2,000 DVDs and flyers and we posted flyers up around the uh, community that essentially had the badge of uh, Greenfield Police Department and said public memo like do not do not we have reason to believe Pete Aaron and Daniel Freeman uh, you know who've been victimized by Greenfield PD are coming back to town and do not talk to them do not go to the website do not tell them about your own victimization you do not attend their trial do not attend their presentation because we did a know your rights presentation in town as well and and so you know we had a lot we couldn't walk down Main Street without people from the area saying cop block I love you guys and telling us their story I mean it was an on-the-ground grassroots thing and the local media the local paper there you know, wasn't was pretty much ignored what happened, but I think uh, us being on the ground and connecting with people made it made a huge difference. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we lost everything we did in the courtroom. I mean, every motion, everything we, we tried to ask questions about or not do, we lost. But we had such a support from the community and the, what we call the court of public opinion that it, I think it was really hard for them. Not to mention the jurors were were you know exceptional at just. I mean, the video helped. Being able to show people the alleged crime helped, but uh, the jurors were voting with their conscience, essentially. They figured that one juror that we interviewed afterwards said, I didn't want to put you guys in jail for this. Well, I'm not sure I'd call your motion to suppress a loss because I think that filing that um, caused the prosecutor to dismiss those charges and then there, he mooted the issue and well, you were unable to talk about it. Sure, I guess he smelled the loss I mean, coming I mean, I mean that, loss of time is in, because I, mean, I know the motion yeah. I filed was like 40 pages. I put a good 10, 12 hours of work into that. For the I motion to suppress? Or the yeah. No, okay. Right. Fine, right. Really on my own. Well, and that kind of leads into what I wanted to ask you about your trial preparation. How much time do you guys think you spent getting ready for trial? What sort of resources did you rely on? How can other people out there in TV land who find themselves in this situation sort of, you know, do an adequate job the way you guys did without having legal skills, legal degrees? I just I think it's all about being transparent. Just let people get to know who you are and just be straight up about everything. I mean, if, if, if you are, you know, as we advocate, not violating someone's rights, their person or their property, then you have nothing to hide. You have nothing to fear. And just, you know, be confident in your actions. And they're the people in the wrong, despite the fact that they have all the guns and the cages to put you in. I mean, at the end of the day, people, are, people see who, who the aggressors are. And, and being able to document it with video is powerful. So Well, you took the time to look up the statutes, right? Yeah. I mean, and so you did a legal analysis of what the elements of the crime were that the state would need to prove. Right. We, I don't know if we went that far exactly. I mean, we did. I think what we did well in this case was that we highlighted how, like Pete said, being transparent, knowing you haven't harmed anybody. Like, there's no victim. There's no crime. We didn't destroy anybody's property. We didn't hurt any individual. And we didn't uh, uh, fraudulently coerce somebody into giving us any of their property or, or wealth. 
And so that's but one none of the, none of those things are traditional defenses in the they law are system. Not, no, but <laughs> yeah, we were so. coming with the jury with that too. But we also said, hey, you know, besides this, which is yeah. enough really to us, but well, let's look at your wiretapping law. It says secretive, right. willfully. You know, these aren't things that that matter. We also wanted to go further into the realm of logic and say you were filming us at the same time. You're public officials. You are servants of the people. I should be allowed to record servants of the people at all times. First Amendment, Constitution. You have the right to gather information on government officials. You know, we're free, freedom of press. I mean, there's a so you took the time things. to put these thoughts down into coherent, right. organized presentations. Absolutely, and we brainstormed together. Closing about, argument. Yep, we brainstormed together uh -huh. about uh, questions. You know, we basically mm -hmm. broke the case up to I would head up wiretapping. He was going to head up resisting and trespassing, which we did have all the way up until the day of trial, and then the DA dropped that off, which is a good tip for people at home to know. The you know. The first plea deal they give you, if you're going to take the plea deal, just keep saying no until trial. All the way up, that plea deal is good up until five minutes before the trial. Just wait. It'll, it'll get better. Like, always gets better. I mean, we were facing a couple months in jail, a year of probation, and like $800 fine and on the first plea deal. The last one was 300 bucks, and you can just get out of my hair, essentially. And, you know, for us, you know, we didn't want to admit to doing anything wrong, so because we didn't do anything wrong. Now, are you planning a lawsuit against Greenfield PD? Um, I'm not sure what plans we have for the Greenfield PD at the moment, but I would really like to hold the police accountable for their actions as I would any individual who's wronged anybody. Right. We shouldn't just say the police or Greenfield police. I mean, th that's just an organization, you know, like, just like the government. I can't say it's like me versus the government. It's individuals within the government or individuals at Greenfield PD who violate, violated our rights that day. So they need to be personally responsible. You know, there's no shirking of responsibility based on where you're employed. Yeah, I'd like to see maybe a public outcry from the people there in Greenfield that don't approve or have had some of these officers do similar things to them and maybe that would uh, lead to a loss of job or something because that's what I feel should happen. I don't think these guys should be officers, especially uh, uh, Dodge and Gordon who broke into Pete's home you know, and searched through my property as well. Yeah, I mean, if the roles were reversed, if these individuals didn't have badges on that day and they just broke into my RV and took some of our property and, and uh, you know, for They'd be considered for criminals. Here, oh, they are criminals in my eyes, yes. yes. And, and that's essentially the winning in the court of public opinion, just communicating that to people, you know, and I think that did make a big difference, like getting folks out, out on the street to support us. We went around town, we had uh, people from the area come out with us with cameras and, and record uh, their interactions. We had a lot of them show up in court with us, as was mentioned, and that, that really set the tone. And, and, you know, the energy was contagious after the opening statements, after good points were made, after closing, there was applause. You so know, you think the supporters that showed up really helped? Definitely. And it was one of the most powerful things for me about the whole process was at the end, you know, after the not guilty verdicts came came down and everyone clapped, the jury, as they got up to leave, they got a standing ovation. And, you know, that was a great pat on the back. They, they did the right thing that day. So, so uh, let's talk about the, um, the jury trial itself and uh, what, are some of the, what are some of the practical tips and advice you can give other people for um, how they can conduct successful jury trials, pro se. Sure. For me, I mean, don't be intimidated by it. It's it's more scary than it actually looks, and you know, less scary. Excuse me, less scary than it actually looks. <laughs> and uh, so when you get up there, I mean, just it, it, don't worry so much about the legal mumble jumbo. You know, uh, like we said, the truth is on our side. Our consciences were clear the day we stepped into the court, and that really helps. And if that's the situation you find yourself in, then you, you'll do fine. But I mean, tell the truth. Speak to the the jurors directly. Um, in cross-examinations, I like to, you know, not necessarily lead the witness, but y you don't want to ask them, like, where were you on this corner? Like, do you remember being on this corner? Like, allow them to right. framing questions. Right. Don't ask open-ended questions. Ask yes or no's. Ask questions you already have answers to. How like did that. you guys learn some of these tactics? Matlock. <laughs> uh, I mean, kind of. A little Law bit of Mason. Like, yeah, I, had a dad who I don't know what he's talking about. But. <laughs> but a little bit. No, court TV series. That's, and, like, uh -huh. I've, I'm also, you know, I've been in and out of the court system before all for victimless crimes with no violence and you know you pick up a thing or two watching a court case or just do you guys think you'll ever get arrested again i hope not i hope not. i don't i, I mean, never tried to get arrested i mean to be honest with the, the the size and scope of the state today and what people who work for that you know agency think that they can get away with uh, look looking to a piece of paper you know to guide their actions rather than their conscience then yes i mean there may be some time essentially all we're doing was asking questions you know, I would, I would hope anybody watching this, if ordered to do something by someone else and that they don't want to, you know, that they would rather not do, I hope they would ask a question and say why, or, or at least, or say no, you know. And 
But to answer your question about how we learned how to do this, um, in 2009 we uh, fortunately got arrested in Mississippi, a similar thing, a fishing expedition, and uh, we had a pro, uh, some few lawyers stepped up at that, at that point, and one of the guys, Tom Schoenhorst, is a reti retired law professor from Indiana, and he, he was great. He's, he's been helping us, um, you know, sh sharing some uh, potential questions we could ask and just reemphasizing, you know, like how we should conduct uh, ourselves. So it's just, you know, we, we take uh, some information and resources from a variety of sources and, and just, you know, put that together with our how we are ourselves and hash it out and we'll work together. You know? right, it's like a mashup of like uh, in the system, out of the system uh, mm -hmm. activism essentially. You guys maintain a pretty high profile on the internet and so has it been your experience that people kind of come out of the woodwork to seek you out and to offer assistance? I mean at times, I mean every time we get in one of these situations, unfortunately I say every time, it's twice, but um, it, like when we were in Jones County, mm -hmm. Mississippi, there was a lot of folks down there that hey, this is my story, share it with you, and they want to buy you a meal or like hang out with you for the day. And you know, there is the Donnie and Anna in uh, Greenfield that were like helping us hand out stuff like crazy. And you know, a shop owner who took us in and another guy who let us hang out at his place and work. So. There were even just random townspeople that showed up to the court. Yeah. Um, just because they saw you passing out flyers and saw the signs people were holding up before court. Yeah, w one anecdotal story to like support that about the, the way the community responded was uh, we went out one night when we were in Greenfield uh, a couple months ago and uh, some people from the area joined us. You know, we had cameras every time we saw the police uh, stop somebody, we went there just to hold them accountable, make sure nothing fishy happened. And, uh, you know, Dame was talking to some of them, some of the uh, officers that were there and uh, uh, one of the one of the officers sitting in a squad car turns on his spotlight. It was in the it was at night, and he just shines it directly at my camera, you know. And I, I said, "Hey, man, that's real mature. Like I'm somebody who wants to hold everybody accountable, make sure everybody's safe. This could be, you know, to help you as well." And uh, you know, and, and I asked him, "Hey, is this why you took this job?" Kind of questions. And then, and then what did I hear over my shoulder? There's about half a dozen or ten people from that were walking down the street, watching this unfold, saying, "Hey, we got your back." To me and a demo and everybody, and, and then telling the cop what they were doing was wrong. So it's it's Good. great. People are being empowered when they see, you know, they don't have to be scared of these folks. What other kind of organizations are out there that are really pushing for police accountability? Are you guys aware of any besides Cop Block? I mean, there's organizations like Cop Watch. I mean, there's Leap and some other programs that try to hold <coughs> police accountable or change the laws that they have. Um, but, I mean... Yeah, at the end of the day, we try to strike the root. And, you know, we don't think if you have a badge of extra rights, and Cop Block is where it's at about that. There's a Cop Block chapter that sprung up in Pittsburgh and Virginia and some folks, you know, all around the, all around the country. So it's good to see. So you definitely encourage people to start their own cop block affiliation. Yeah, it's decentralized. Excellent. Yeah, do whatever you need to uh, hold those in your area accountable. Excellent. Thank you for joining us tonight. Appreciate the opportunity. Appreciate Thank you for joining Free Keen TV tonight. We appreciate comments and liberty-minded story suggestions. So please write to us at tv at We'll see you next Monday. I'm Michelle Seven. Good night.